Hello, my merry band of OSATers, and welcome to this, the 78th edition of the Sockmetician podcast. My name is Nathan Taylor, otherwise known as Sockmetician, and I am recording today in a very, very warm flat somewhere in North London. Today is Thursday, the something of May? <laughs> it's the 28th of May today, I had to check. Isn't it odd, this time of year, when you're in lockdown, and you know it's kind of sunny outside and you've got no idea whether it's July or September. <laughs> it is a very strange time, isn't it? I know I talked about this a lot last time, but it's uh, it's ongoing and uh, I, I, I'm finding the days are all rolling into one and I have absolutely no concept of where I am at any given point. It's really, really peculiar. I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, let's crack on straight away with the podcast uh, goodies because there's, I've been experimenting a lot this week with with knitting and doing other things with my needles that I, I, I kind of want to get on and show you. So uh, let's start off as usual with our little numbers roundup. Today, as I said, is the 78th edition of the podcast. <laughs> Brace yourselves. <laughs> Here it comes. Okay, so 78 uh, is... The very first sentence on this page is something I don't even understand. It is the dimension... 78 is the dimension of the exceptional lie group E, little number six, and several related objects. Well, good. <laughs> I'm delighted to know that. I'm still none the wiser. Don't worry. I checked into uh, the, the, the linked page. No point. Not a clue. Not a Scooby. Um, it is... Now, I'm delighted about 78. 78 is one of my... It's, it's in a group, which is one of my favourite groups of numbers. Obviously, I have a favourite group of numbers, as I'm sure doesn't everybody. <laughs> 78 is a Svenic number. Svenic. Svenic. Um, <laughs> a Svenic number is a number which, uh, is, <laughs> which has three distinct prime factors. There you go. <laughs> And if you're none the wiser about that, um, a prime number, of course, is a number which can only be divided by one and itself. And uh, distinct means sort of separate and unique. And uh, factors, a factor of a number, um, six, for example, uh, if we're talking about the number six, two and three are factors of six because two multiplied by three gives you six. So anything that gets multiplied together to give you the result is a factor of, of the result itself. So 78 is our result, and it is a Svenic number because it is the uh, the product, as in multiplying together, three distinct primes. So, what are they? <laughs> the three distinct primes in, uh, well, oh. I haven't even worked this out. I don't know, and I'm not entirely sure that I can link to it very quickly. I wanted to tell you, and that page doesn't say it. Um, so, it's, it's a, <laughs> it totally doesn't say here, this is going to be terribly dull. So, um, the smallest Svenic number, for example, is, uh, 30, uh, which is the product of the three smallest primes, I'm sure I can work this out, actually. So, 2, 3, and 5 is, uh, 30. 2, 3, and 6 gives you 42, which is the next, uh, Svenic number. Two, five, and six gives you two. <laughs> I'm not doing this very well. Two, five is ten, and six is sixty. Uh, no, because six is not a prime. What am I talking about? Two, five, and seven. I, do you know, ignore everything I just said. I was not thinking straight, and I really have no idea. So it's likely to be uh, two. Five and seven gives you thirty-five or seventy. So it's not that it's going to be three. <laughs> I can't work it out. <laughs> three, five, and seven. That's not seventy either. This is a disaster. My brain. Literally, the matician part of my brain has fled the building. I am... 
a little over hot and a little over tired and I can't work it out. But by the time I edit this out together, I will be pleased to tell you that the three prime factors of the number 78 are in fact <laughs> on the screen now. I'm so sorry, that's a terrible way to start, isn't it? You'd think I'd have sorted this out. Anyway, that's a Svenic number and 78 is one of them. Um, it's actually only the fifth, so the Svenic numbers are 30, 42, 66, 70 and 78. Um, <laughs> disastrous. It's also an abundant number. I mean, if you've got 78 of anything, you've got an abundance of most things, I would suggest. But an abundant number... Hmm. <sighs> you ready for this? An abundant number has an aliquot sum that is higher than itself. <laughs> an aliquot sum is when you get uh, the divisors, so not just prime divisors, but any divisors of a number which uh, add up together. A perfect number, for example, is anything, is a number like the number six. I think we spoke about this last time. Um, numbers, maybe we didn't. Maybe I've just dreamt it. But num the number six is a perfect number because uh, it can be divided by one, two, three, and six. Taking out six because that's the number itself, one, two, and three add up to six. So that makes it a perfect number. So all the things that you can divide the number by, apart from the number itself, add up to make the number itself. That makes it a perfect number. Um, and that number that you add things up, the, the sum of all the divisors is called the aliquot sum, or aligo sum, I don't know if it's a French word or not, I'm going to call it the aliquot sum because I think it sounds kind of fun to say in the mouth, aliquot. Um, I like it. And uh, the aliquot sum of 78 is 90, which is more than the number itself. So of course it's not a perfect number, but it is therefore an abundant number because its aliquot sum is higher than itself. Does that make sense? I think that does. Um, it's a semi-perfect number, being uh, a multiple of a perfect number. And any, apparently any multiple of a perfect, uh, yeah, any multiple of a perfect number is a semi-perfect number. I'm sure there's more to the definition than that, but um, one of the divisors of 78 is six, which is of course a perfect number. I've just illustrated that, and that makes 78 a semi-perfect number. It is the 12th triangular number. Triangular numbers are um, the sum of, so the 12th triangular number will be the sum of 12 and all of the numbers down to one below it. So 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 equals 78, which makes it, according to some people's maths, the total number of presents given in the 12 days of Christmas. Now, of course, some people would argue that you repeat things again and again and again, so therefore you have to, have to add them up again and again and again. But actually, there are only 12 days of Christmas and in the song, and, uh, and on one day... Are, are, is the song... So this is the age-old question, isn't it? Is the song saying that on the 12th day of Christmas that you, the, the singer's true love gave to the singer 12 Lords Leaping, 11 Ladies Dancing and all of these, or were those things just sort of being mentioned because they were previous gifts? If there are only one set, if there's only one set of gifts on a day, <laughs> this conversation's going nowhere, then the number of gifts given, the partridge and the pear tree. Well, you see, the partridge and the pear tree, does that mean the pear tree is part of the gift or just the partridge? You have to go up the tree and get it yourself, because if, if so, that's a pretty lame gift, isn't it? There you go, it's up there. I, I, I can catch it yourself. Um, but does that count as two gifts, a partridge and a pear tree? Otherwise, all of this goes out the window, so let's stop talking about it right away. It is also, well, you know, we talked about palindromes last week, or last time, should I say, and interestingly, a lot of people did, uh, if you check the comments underneath uh, the last YouTube video, uh, so it's episode 77, lots of people were saying that there are indeed palindromes, word palindromes, in, in many languages, probably, probably all languages then, it, it, it's clearly a thing. And some of them are absolutely brilliant. My favourite one of all happens to be, let me just find it, because uh, I, I don't speak Spanish, but uh, um, it is, it's a Spanish one and I absolutely loved it. Um, so let me find it here. Let's, let's go to my channel. It's, uh, it's a self-referencing 
palindrome, which is brilliant. It actually sort of quotes the fact that it's a palindrome in itself. And it says, uh, here it is, um, Se verlas al reves. I'm sorry if that's badly pronounced, but uh, here it is on screen now. Se, uh, se verlas al reves. And it means, I can see them backwards. Ah, isn't that brilliant? It's like the most meta thing in the world, and I absolutely love it. Thank you to everybody who uh, posted palindromes on that uh, comment thread. It was really, really fascinating. I really enjoyed reading all of them and learning a little bit about uh, wordplay in other people's languages. Words are such... such... <laughs> this sounds like such a stupid thing to say. Words have always been my friends. I really, really like words and I like making up words and uh, I'm aware that sometimes that gets me into trouble, but I, I still love words. I was a voracious reader as a child and I started reading at a very, very young age and I, I've never stopped being fascinated by words. It is my absolute dream of an ambition to get one of my made up words in circulation to the level at which it goes into the dictionary. <laughs> You can't just put a word in the dictionary. It has. It only goes into the dictionary because it's in use. So uh, dictionaries don't tell people what words are. People using words inform what goes into the dictionary. So if I could get one of my words into the dictionary, that would be amazing. Oh, I'd love it. Um, so uh, going back to our words, then the last couple of things I'm going to say about our numbers, I should say, um, it is a palindromic number but not in base 10. Now we you, we have 10 fingers, so we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and those are the numbers in base 10. But if you are in base 5, don't even ask, if you're in base 5, so if you had 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, you know, if you, if you only count up to 4 before you change the digit in the, in the next column, 78 is listed as 303 in base 5, and it is 141 in base 7. It is... <laughs> it... I don't even know what, whether I'm saying the right things, because there's other numbers here as well. In base 5, it brackets 303... Yeah, okay, so in... I, don't, I was reading this right, I, I panicked then. So in base 7 is 141, in base 12 it's 66 in base 12. It is uh, 25 in base, sorry, it's 33 in base 25. It's 22 in base 38. It's 77, no it's not, it's 11 in base 77. <laughs> and all bases greater than 78. What? I don't understand that at all. Oh, enough, enough numbers, enough. Let's talk about knitting, shall we? <laughs> I would like to say before we do, actually, I have, um, it's been, it's, since I last spoke to you, I've been out and about a bit. Um, here in the UK, the, the, the restrictions on travel have been relaxed uh, and uh, we are now allowed to travel around the country as long as you're still obeying social distancing uh, regulations, of course. Now, I wouldn't do anything to put anybody else at risk um, and I, but I am aware that, uh, Contact, FaceTime, I don't mean the, the app, I mean face-to-face -face time with another human being is a really important part of, of, of being a human being and being a social animal. And, uh, and I know it's something that a lot of people have struggled because they haven't been able to get that over the last couple of months. Ben's parents, um, notably, have struggled with that quite a lot. And, and as soon as we could, really, we decided that we would arrange with them at their comfort levels um, to go and visit them. It's only about an hour and a quarter drive from here. It's not, it's not very far. And so we set off, we we packed up our picnic. Um, we took all of our drinks, all of our napkins, all of our cutlery, crockery, absolutely everything with us so we wouldn't need anything of theirs. We weren't going to go into the house under any circumstances and we did not. Um, neither were we going to go into their garden. Now, I... I, I'm not questioning the laws that have, the, the the rules that have been put in place because I understand the absolute need for uh, for containing the spread of the virus to a 
to the level at which our health systems can cope. I, I totally understand that and I am absolutely all for it. Um, I sort of don't really see the difference between meeting a person and staying apart from them, but, but meeting up with a person in a park or meeting up in their garden. Um, uh, and this was discussed on the BBC News and it seems that the reason why they've said not in the garden is because they don't want to encourage people to go into each other's houses. And if they're in the garden, in some people's houses, you would have to go through the house to get to the garden. This isn't true of my of my parents-in-law. Nonetheless, we uh, decided to meet them at a picnic. Now, because they wanted to, to adhere to the rules as strictly as possible, which means that you can only meet one person from a household that's not your own, um, not two. And of course we are two and two, although again, I don't really understand why. I would be interested to know if there's a real difference why. It's probably just to, to discourage large groups of people gathering. Um, but if you're two people from one household and you're two people from one household and you don't get closer than two metres away from each other, I don't really see where the extra risk lies there. Um, and I'd be very happy to for someone to explain it to me um, if there's a genuine reason for that, because I'm interested to know. Um, but we decided that we they wanted to, uh, to to keep to that. So we had pulled up in the drive in the car and and his mum came out and joined joined us, but apart <laughs> all the cabin. You know, we, we didn't go anywhere near each other. She joined the two of us and we went off up the road. And then uh, Ben's dad followed us a little bit later on. And when we, we rendezvoused in a field, um, half a mile from their house and the, the two of us on our little picnic blanket and then Richard joined Noel and we stayed apart. It was lovely to see them, it really was. Um, it was actually hard as well. Um, the moment when, when we got out of our car, I was driving and I watched, I was on the driver's side, I watched across the roof of the car as Ben got out and his mum came round the corner from her garden onto the drive. And and she looked, she looked sort of scared, really, reticent. Ob obviously, I think the reticence was, I want to come and give you a hug and I know I can't. But it was really difficult to see somebody so familiar, obviously for them, a mother and son, not to be able to get together. It was actually hard, it felt harder than seeing people on screen only. Um, and for a brief moment, I regretted the fact that we'd done it at all. We were so eager to to be able to be in the same space, but actually to, to see somebody looking scared of us like we were a threat and, and to feel the same sort of need for distance, not just not just because it was it's the rules, but because suddenly there was a real reason to. Obviously, we want to protect them, um, so we don't want to do anything to jeopardise that. So it, it was it was it's really upsetting actually. That aside, we did get over that, and we had a very lovely picnic. And uh, Ben's mum, she did say she had organisers there at their house. They have a downstairs toilet, which is just literally just inside the front door. There's a door there. And she said she had arranged it all. If we desperately needed to go, she said, you can go in. We've got gloves. We've got masks. And you can go in and you can not touch anything. And you want to just come straight out and we'll anti back everything. Very sweet of her. Needless to say, we didn't. We held it. <laughs> I think Ben went behind a bush before we went back to the house to get the car. And we didn't go into the house at all. Um, it was weird. It was really, really weird. The next day, um, we had arranged with our friend Meriel that we would have another social distance picnic, um, this time down in Lewis, which is outside Lewis, uh, near Brighton, um, at a place called Tide Mills on the beach. So we uh, we went and we met there, and uh, she's one person with two, of course, and we had a, a lovely social distance walk and a social distance picnic. Um, and it, it sort of felt we could pretend that nothing else was going on. Um, we were on the beach. There were quite a few other people out on the beach. It's a pebble beach, so it's not the most comfortable beach for um, lying around on. <laughs> In fact, it's a really steep beach. So you walk onto these pebbles, and they're, they're big. They're like fist-sized pebbles. They're not. It's not little gravel at all. And then there's this steep, really steep shelf down to a, a lower level, which is where the water 
and the way you slosh in and out. Um, and nobody really goes, nobody leaves their stuff down there because it's warmer and, and flatter up at the top level. Um, and it's very steep on the way down to the water. So we said we wanted to go in to the water, so we all took our uh, shoes and socks off. Meryl, very sensibly, had brought some crocs with her so that she could go in and out of the water with shoes on. I did not. Um, and, oh my goodness, that beach is the most painful experience you can possibly imagine. So, so painful. I, my feet... Now, it may be true, it may be true that I've gained a few pounds in lockdown. I'm calling it being lockdown ready. <laughs> Hair's a bit too long, beard's a bit too shaggy, bit out of condition, not fit. Um, that's lockdown ready, right? Um, it may be that I'm lockdown ready, but I don't think I've put on enough weight to sufficiently mean that my feet can no longer cope with the weight that I'm carrying. <laughs> it's just painful. So uh, I was like, ah. <laughs> Eventually, I, I just couldn't do it, so I, I strapped my shoes, these shoes are so tatty, but um, I strapped these shoes to, I literally stood on the top and tied my laces around the top <laughs> so I could like, just use them as, as platforms. Why I didn't just put them back on, I'll never know, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. And I walked down into the water and once I was in the water it was fine, um, except that the waves are quite strong. <laughs> Excuse me. And the waves would come in, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this on a sandy beach, but if you're standing still, as the wave comes in, as the, the wave comes out again, it sort of sucks with it, and it sucks the sand away from around your foot, leaving you just on a little bit of, on the, in the middle of your foot, which then sort of evens itself out. But it was doing that with the pebbles as well. So what was happening, if I was standing quite comfortably, a wave would come in and suck out all the pebbles from around the outside and leave me standing on just three really sharp pebbles. Every time a wave came in, I was in agony. Also, the water was incredibly cold. So by this point, my feet were getting a little bit numb and a little bit sensitive. <laughs> now I tried to get back up the beach it was it was so so painful i i had to abandon it completely i literally couldn't because it was so steep as well you, you have to put quite a lot of effort onto your feet and a lot of weight on your feet to be able to drag yourself up it it wasn't happening so thankfully i did have my shoes nearby so i thought i'll just sit down and i'll I didn't have my socks. I'd left them up there. I couldn't get my shoes on because my feet weren't, weren't dry yet and it was salt water so everything was really sticky. <laughs> I just... For the first time in my life, I experienced true helplessness. Um, and although I was laughing at it, I was, I was still thinking, my goodness, I, I should be so capable. I'm a fit, healthy 45 year old man. I should not be in this much discomfort and impossibility of getting out of it. <sighs> it was a crazy, crazy, crazy day. It's quite a long day as well. Um, we, we then we got home quite late at night and we were exhausted because obviously we hadn't been doing anything apart from sitting in this house for nearly three months. and. And the beginning of that three months, we were both ill, so we sort of lost all kind of stamina and the will to do things. So suddenly having two days where we've been driving around the country, I know it's kind of kid in the candy shop kind of thing. Suddenly you can, yes, great, off you go. And we did. And it was lovely to see people, but uh, it made me realise that we're not used to that anymore. And I wonder if we will be again. I wonder if we will get to the stage where we can uh, kind of go back to normal. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. We, uh, I was looking at, at, out in the street today and there were plenty of people in the shops where we were going to get our bits and pieces and it seems in the street that a lot of people have forgotten to be considerate. Um, now, my own opinion of that is that that's, that's down to them. I will keep myself as separate from people as I possibly can in the street and in shops as well. Um, and I'm not going to get cross with someone if they're standing a little bit close to me, I can move away. But uh, I have noticed that there seems to be a little less diligence than, than there has been. Um, 
I haven't been keeping a, an eye on the uh, the facts and figures and the, the statistics relating to the relaxing of the rules here and, and whether our rates of infection have, have gone back up again. Um, I know that what started in London as the epicentre of the country, and I have to say, being frowned upon by everybody else in the rest of the country, um, of course London was the hot spot. It's where all the airports are, so of course that's where all the tourists and everyone coming into the country was bringing coronavirus with them. Um, and London is a very, very densely populated area. And before we knew about the social distancing uh, regulations and the reasons for them, of course that's what's happening. Now, of course, London is kind of not over it, but getting certainly through the worst of it, of this first wave anyway. Um, and and that spread is rippling up the country. There are some very, very bad hotspots in various parts of the UK and up in Scotland. I believe it's particularly bad. Um, that's just how it is. Uh, so I, I don't know whether these easing... Uh, procedures have, have sort of affected that in any way. I'll be interested to see. I hope not. Um, I hope that we are now at a stage where, where it's kind of manageable with what we are doing and we can hopefully continue to get back to normal as soon as possible. Enough about that. Enough about that. Sick of it. Um, so I have been very, very busy uh, with my needles. It's been I've taken kind of a week off from doing book knitting and book writing. Um, I apologise for that for anyone who's eager for the book. I need some brain space. I need to do something different. I was feeling all all booked out, I'm afraid. Um, but I have... Well, some of it's for the book. Some, some, of it's, some of it's related to... The, it's knitting, isn't it? It's all good stuff. Um, I've got a lot of little swatches here, one of which... Uh, I don't think I talked about this last time. No, I didn't. I've, you see, the thing is, I, I forget what I've spoken about on here because I do my uh, uh, Thursday Zoom be-alongs, one of which is happening tonight in just about an hour's time, so I better get a wriggle on. Um, so I, I do my be-alongs. I talk about the stuff I've been doing there. So it's, it feels like I've already spoken about this stuff. And it's almost sometimes in the, the, the be-along, I'm pointing at my laptop because that's where... <laughs> that's where zoom is for me um it sometimes feels like i'm doing a bit of a live version of the podcast so i feel i've already talked about it let's let's pretend i haven't um and if i have you can uh, talk about it uh, we can talk about it you can you can skip forward i have been intrigued recently by the concept of triple knitting and obviously i'm a double knitting fanatic and uh i'd like to think expert um I certainly have learnt a lot about it over the years. And double knitting um, is tends to be a two-colour technique with two sides. A piece of fabric obviously has a front and a back. A piece of fabric isn't a triangle, so how can it have a third side? How can it be triple knitting? Do I mean it's just double knitting with three colours? No, I don't. I really don't mean that. I've tried three-colour double knitting before, just just because I wanted to see uh, how it worked and wanted to have the experience of it, and I really didn't like it. I really, really didn't like it. I knitted a, uh, I don't think I have it anymore, um, I knitted, actually, do you know, I think it's in the freezer. <laughs> Before we moved in here, a year ago, we had a bad moth problem at the last place, thankfully, no signs y here yet, so uh, fingers crossed on that. But there was some stuff that came into the flat that had to be in quarantine. Um, and I had sealed bags, I put them in the freezer. <laughs> Our freezer froze over a bit. And uh, we haven't had a chance to defrost it yet. So, because uh, the, the door's not particularly well sealed and air got in and frost starts to build up and has completely enveloped one of the bags. <laughs> it's got a couple of pairs of socks in it. And I believe it's got this piece of three colour double knitting in it. And it welded to one. <laughs> One of the shelves, we can't get it off. It's not going to come. So I have tried it, um, and I did a uh, years years ago. Uh, I did a three colour Union Jack, so the flag of the UK. And the thing with double knitting is that 
unlike stranded knitting where, or fair arm knitting where where you've got one stitch making the knit stitch on the front and the other just going flat across the back making a float those floats don't have the same stretch so the fabric doesn't have the same movement in it but double knitting where one stitch is doing that on the front the other stitch of the other color sorry one yarn is doing that on the front making a stitch the other yarn is making a stitch on the back fabric so both of the fab both sides of the fabric have the same amount of stretch there's no rigidity because of the floats now, with standard double knitting, you, you're knitting pairs, so one for the front and one for the back, one for the front and one for the back, and, and to get the reverse colours and the sort of negative mirror image of what's going on from one side to the other, the reason for that is because if you work one stitch for the front with yarn A, you then work the stitch for the back with yarn B, and so that's how you keep all the stretch and how you keep all the colours uh, uh, nice and uh, all in the right places. So that means you're, you're either knitting an AB pair or you're knitting a BA pair and that's how you build up the different patterns. Now with three colours in double knitting there are various ways you can do it but my preferred way would be to rotate the colours in three pairs so if you're knitting uh, with colour A on the front you use colour B on the back, if you're using colour B on the front you use C on the back and if you're using C on the front you go around to using A on the back. So so those are the three pairs that you can do, three different types of pairs. Uh, which also, that is it isn't it? Yeah just those, those three. Um, and that covers all the different colour options you could mix those things up and have two different patterns front and back there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't do that and in fact it it has been done many times um but that's sort of the standard way the most sort of logical way of doing it the problem with that is because the fabric only has two sides there are two layers it is double knitting so it has two layers of fabric it's not called double knitting because there's two colors no 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 it's double because it's two layers there are only two stitches in the pair front and back so if you're using colour A on the front and colour B on the back, colour C, therefore, has to strand between the two and hide itself between them. So it's almost like a hybrid between uh, double knitting and stranded knitting. There are floats where there aren't normally in double knitting. So I, over the years, I've been sort of been sponging up bits and pieces of other knowledge. Um, and my friend Ruth Churchman uh, has been doing some experiments into uh, interlaced layered knitting uh, based on the work of the physicist uh, Alistair Crum Brown. Um, actually, do you know what? I will, I'll put information on screen about Ruth's blog about the subject. I won't go into too much detail about it, but she was she was trying to recreate some knitted samples that Alistair Crum Brown had done. I guess about 100 years ago. Um, the samples still exist in Edinburgh, in the Museum of Scotland, Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. Um, I'm gonna get all the details wrong, so visit Ruth's uh, um, blog and find the, the real fact. It's fascinating stuff, really, really fascinating stuff. But she, she was trying to replicate what he was doing, and he was using three different colors and making three different layers of fabric um, and wherever he wanted to change the colour on the front, he wasn't actually changing the colour, he was pulling through. So if you've got um, like black, white and red, three layers. So if he was on the on the red layer, if he wanted some uh, an area to show black, rather than just knit those stitches in black, what he was doing was pulling the black layer through to the front in between the stitches and 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 allowing things to be kind of multi-dimensional. It's, it's really, really clever stuff. To be honest, not much practical application for it other than to uh, demonstrate these multi-dimensional properties of matter um, and knitting being stretchy and pliable was 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 a good uh, uh, substance for him to use for that um, but I can't really see any need for it but he, he had never left any notes at all on how he had done it. Ruth has managed to figure it out. Then I was talking to uh, my friend Micah who comes to my Zoom be along as well. And she has done some triple layered knitting in the past because she wanted to uh, make a multicolored square, wanted to use the, the third color, but didn't like the rigidity that caused by the floats, as I didn't. Also, two, a three color double knitting 
tangling because you're only using two yarns at a time. The third one is constantly getting tangled up. Around. It's, it's a nightmare and I hated it. So in talking to Micah and to Ruth, I, I suddenly started to think, well, this is really, really kind of useful. And here's, here's why. I don't like the floats. Um, the floats change the stru structure of the fabric um, and they cause and gapping and all, all sorts of things going on. You can see the thing going through. However, in triple knitting, because and it's and it's not three color two uh, double knitting. It is triple knitting. There's a third layer, a sandwiched hidden layer in between the front and the back. So if I've got black and white on front and back, I'm knitting with the the black and I'm purling with the white to create those two. There's going to be a third layer in the middle, which has a red knit stitch in it as well. So all three colors are going to be making a full stitch, giving you the full stretch. And I suddenly thought, well, that, that keeps the integrity of the fabric really, really well. Um, and this was my first experimentation. Um, I, I had, I, I talked with people about it, how they'd done it, but hadn't really seen it done. I had, it's a lot about yarn management, to keep the, the three layers um, from tangling and to stop bits and pieces from, from showing in all the wrong places. You have to be kind of careful with your yarn management. I need to figure it all out. But this was my first attempt. So I wanted to, first of all, I wanted to uh, try and figure out a way of doing a three colour cast on. Um, this was my first attempt. It, it, this already exists, I, it turns out, and it's a version. Actually, you know, I'm going to move the, oops, sorry to move the camera like that. I'm going to move my light so that you can see. There we go. It's a version. You're not going to be able to see too bright now, isn't it? Uh, it's a version of the, the long tail cast on. If I put my face away, maybe it will focus on that. There you go. Um, it's a version of the long tail cast on, but using three colours. And if you can see, it does have this lovely sort of braided rope effect that goes blue, grey, green, blue, grey, green, all the way across, which is very nice. Um, the problem is because it's a long tail cast on, um, I was only doing the, the knit stitches of the long tail cast on, um, which means that on the other side, I've got these pearl bumps. So it's not reversible. It works perfectly well. Um, and it's actually done really, really simply. I haven't got three colours of yarn to show you, but essentially, um, if you've got the three yarns tied together in a slip knot um, with the loop on, on your needle, normally you'd have the a yarn over thumb and finger, third one dropping down. You'd make the, the knit stitch the normal way with the long tail cast on, replace the thumb, but then you drop those two yarns and rotate them and pick up the third one. So, you've, so if you start with yarns A and B, you drop A and pick up C, so you've got B and C, do another knit stitch, drop B, pick up A, and you've got A and C, and do another knit stitch, and keep rotating it that way. So that's what you get that's why you get that little twisted braided edge there. Um, and that, it, it works very, very well. It does mean you're twisting up all your yarns in a way which is very, very, very difficult to deal with. But it does give you the sets of stitches. Now, of course, in double knitting, we talk about pairs all the time. You can't do that in triple knitting. So uh, you, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna call them trios or triplets because I think theoretically you can expand this and have uh, yeah, it's better, isn't it? You can expand this and have um, four layers, five layers, as many layers as you want. It's, of course, it's going to get thick, really, really thick. Um, but you can you can build on that. So rather than having to name each set of stitches according to how many layers there are, I just thought, well, let's just call them sets of stitches. So I'm going with that as its as its terminology. So the sets of stitches are in threes. It does mean the gauge is a little bit loose because um, my blue stitches here which are all on one layer in on the needles in between each two blue stitches there's blue and then the gray and the green stitches pushing them apart so it takes a little bit of time to get the the gauge sorted out but once you get going it's really fun to do and because i figured out my best way of holding the yarns as all knitters do we, we find Actually, I think knitting techniques finds us. Um, you pick it up one way and you go, oh, now I can't do it with that hand. Oh, I'll do it with this hand. Well, I started holding two over this finger and the third yarn over here. So I'd work with one, work with the second, and then work with the third. 
I found that really, really easy to do because the, the yarns are, are staying in the same position over my fingers, they were not tangling up at all. Brilliant. It flowed really well. It's nice and easy to follow. Um, I made that, it's not a shape, I just made up stuff as I went along. What I didn't particularly bother with was uh, the edges. I just needed a way of locking them all together. Um, so if you can see there, all I did was just braided selvage edge there. Um, I just knitted all three stitches of the last set together with all three yarns together, and then uh, slipped the stitch at the beginning of the next row with the yarn in front and then took it to the to the back. And that gives you that nice sort of braided edge. I don't mind it. It's pretty, it, it was, it's perfectly serviceable and it certainly does the job. Um, but I wasn't really thinking about edges, I was just trying to get the technique down. Then when I got to the top, I had to find a way of binding it off. Now, I had to bind off all three layers. So the front and back at the top of this swatch, front is green, back is blue. The gray layer is tucked in between. Um, and I wanted to find a way of doing a graft across the top, which included and bound off the grey stitches but didn't really show them and it works quite nicely so that's nice and uh, I mean it's nice and kind of invisible uh, it's it's really really stretchy the joy of this of course the integrity of the fabric stays exactly as you'd want it to I I think this is really really fun um, and I've got plans to do some things with it this wasn't enough for me however because I as I said I figured out how to do this cast on and then I was looking on YouTube and I, thought, I wonder if there's a better one one which is uh, reversible now of course the, the the double knitting long tail cast on that I use is reversible because you cast on a knit stitch going towards the thumb then you cast on a purl stitch going towards the finger and you get the alternating stitches now trying to figure out a way of doing that where I was rotating the yarns and only using two at a time proved very, very difficult because I could do the two knit stitches and then when I went to do the, the purl stitch, it goes back the other way and it would, all the colours would be in the wrong place. So I had to ditch that idea. But with a bit of perseverance, this is my second swatch. Mmm, little slice of Battenberg cake. I am really pleased with this. Um, I, I think the gauge, I don't think, I, I, I may have used different needles, but the gauge is very different. Uh, forgive that, I ran out of grey yarn. But it's, that is the kind of, uh, of stitch gauge, I think, that really, really works. And that's perfectly easy to see. And of course, we've still got this lovely stretch. There's no, no problem with floats or anything like that. But the cast on, what I wanted to do was I wanted to find a way of Unlike the other one, which, which shows the braid of all three colours, I wanted to find a way of like replicating. If I show, have I got one? Yes, I've got. Um, so this, that's not a good one to show you. Um, I need a hat. I need one of my hats, which is in this box. One of the hats, which will show a long tail cast on. Here it is. Oh, well, I can't show that. Uh, proprietorial. Um, here we are. Okay. So in this hat here, on the greeny side, you can see there's a contrast edge of black stitches there. And rolling around to the black side, you can see the contrast edge of green stitches there. I wanted to replicate that with the two colours that you would see front and back at the edge of the, at the, edge of the, the swatch. And even though there's a green layer hidden in the middle, I didn't want that to show in the cast on. I wanted it to be included and tucked away, but hidden away. I didn't want much. I found out how to do it, and it's actually much simpler than I was expecting it to be. So you can see here, there are a few green blips, so ignore those, but the centre section here, the middle bit, this is the bit I want you to sort of concentrate on. You can see that I've got this grey contrast edge on the blue side. And rolling around, you get to the blue contrast edge on the grey side, and no sign of the green. But it is cast on, and it is still there. There is still that third layer, it's all caught in. Nice, I like it. Then, then I wanted to try and figure out how to do slip stitch edging, which I favour for all my flat double knitting. Uh, and it gives you this lovely tidy edge. There's no garter bumps there. There's a lo this lovely clean line delineation between the grey side and the blue side there. 
what you always do get with the slip stitch edge, because the fabric of double knitting is not actually back to back like this, it's actually skewed off by half a stitch like that. So you'll always see on one side, you'll always see the other colour poking through. When you turn it over, you still see the colour poking through on the same side as you look at it. So that's true. If I can show you on this scarf here, you can see on... So the, this side is blue right to the edge, but here there's grey poking around. If I turn it over, you've got the blue poking around to the side on this side and not on that side. So I'm aware that that's part of, uh, of how it works. And I managed to find a way of catching all of those uh, layers in together. But this time you do get to see all three layers stacked up and that green layer tucked there in the centre between the grey and the blue. And it's true on the other side as well. So if you see this is the side they poke around, it's more pronounced because there are three of them stacked up. One, two and three, grey, green and blue. But then you turn it over and again it's on this side that it shows. I don't mind that because it mirrors what I do with double knitting anyway. Um, it just sort of exaggerates it because it is a... Uh... Oh, I'm getting so geeky. And then I uh, again wanted to do the Kitchener graft across the top which hides the green layer in there. So basically what the Kitchener graft does, rather than just grafting two stitches together, what it's doing is you, you have to sort of turn some stitches around so that you're grafting a decrease between um, layers one and two, and then grafting that combination of layers one and two to the live stitches on layer three. It, it sounds really, really complex. It's actually really logical. Everything in knitting is logical, if you ask me. It really, really is. And I, the more I delve into the uh, the bowels of of the structure and the engineering of knitting, the more I realise that the the rules are the same. So, all I've been doing really is is trying to expand on what's possible in double knitting and make it applicable for triple knitting. And actually, it's not been as difficult to do as I had first thought. It's literally just saying, okay, well, where do I factor in this third layer? Really, really interesting stuff. It occurred to me halfway up this little swatch, I love this swatch, this might become a hat. Um, it occurred to me halfway up this swatch that there might be a way, I'm not saying that this is wrong and not to be revisited, um, but there may be, there's, so many different ways of doing things in knitting. There may be a way of constructing the edges so that I bring the blue and the grey stitches together around the outside of the green stitch, pulling the green, so the, the green layer, the middle layer would be tucked away completely and at the edges all you would see would be the colours that show on the front and the back. I Theoretically I, th I still think it's possible, I haven't had a go with it yet, I'd like to um, put in some practice and, and have a little practice at that because I've got a feeling it is possible, I think I know how it's done, but this is just a, a thought that's swilling around in my head. And the other thing I want to do with this, although I'm really, really happy with it, um, and much as I like this cast on, and it would be great for a hat, I don't want to use this on something like a scarf, because I want top and bottom of my scarf, cast on and bind off, to look the same. Now, when I'm doing scarves, I cast on with the tubular cast on, and it looks like that, and I cast off at the other... Oh, hang on. I get both ends together so you can see I'm not, not cheating. They both... They both look the same. They both have... what well, One is a kitchen a graft, and one is a tubular cast on. They look exactly the same. Now, I would want, if I were to be knitting a scarf with this technique, I would want my tops and bottoms to look the same. At the moment, I've got the decorative edge that the long tail cast on gives you and the clean edge that the, the Kitchener graft gives you. So, my next quest would be to find a way of doing a three colour tubular cast on, or Italian cast on, or an invisible cast on, three colours where the, the middle colour is hidden and you just see the outer colour. I don't I'm not sure if that's going to be possible, but it is my quest and I am going to try and do it. And if I do that, I'll also try and tidy up the sides to hide away that uh, middle layer. Although I like this and I think it's perfectly serviceable, I think it'd be a good experiment to see if it's possible to uh, to hide it away. How exciting is that? I, I, I'm so excited. I love dropping everything here in my excitement. I had another quest. Um, 
I've lost some stuff. That's fine. I had another quest at the same time. I had been um, talking to uh, fabulous Suzanne Bryan and the and the wonderful, wonderful human being who is Lucy Neatby. Lucy Neatby has always been one of my double knitting heroes. She's absolutely brilliant. If you've not come across Lucy Neatby on YouTube, uh, head over to her channel and. She has such a clear and precise way of uh, explaining things. She also um, specialises in large, uh, so, so I, I say so, they're knitted in the round, but, but circular flat blankets, they're, they're actually mostly octagons, the ones that she, she makes, and she starts from the centre and works her way out. Now I know that she uses a version of the, the pinhole cast on, um, and I wanted to... I wanted to pick her brains to see if she knew a way of making a pinhole cast on for uh, double knitting which was reversible with the two colours shown on the other side. So this is this is sort of going away from the triple knitting and back to double knitting at the, for a moment. Um, because the version that she uses, the first round of stitches is the same colour on both sides, it's one yarn, and I wanted to know if there was a, if she had ever come across uh, a two colour version which would have the the reversibility that I like. It's not the end of the world, it's really not, um, and certainly not a criticism of her work at all, it's a, it's a preference of the way she uses it, but I am so, I'm so driven by um, double knitting and what it can give to you, and it can give you this perfect symmetry and mirror image and negative black and white thing. It can be so perfect, I want it to be perfect all the time, does that make sense? I, I don't want to sort of make any compromises on that, and if it is possible, I want to know how it's done and, and make sure that I, I can sort of live up to the nth degree of reversibility, if at all possible. I know, I, it, I'm going to drive myself mad with all of this. I really am, but there's nothing I do about it. I'm, I'm wired that way. So what I actually came up with myself was fiddling around. So to uh, backtrack a second, sorry. If you're not familiar with what I mean when I say a pinhole cast on, I mean the kind of cast on where you make a loop with the tail of yarn and you cast on stitches into that loop, cast on as many as you need, I mean, 8, 16 or whatever, um, the, the, if, you, if you're going to be starting to work in the centre and work as a spiral all the way outwards, what you then do is you can pull on that tail and the loop tightens up and pulls all of the stitches that you just cast on into a tight little circle with, a, with barely any hole at all. It looks a like when you when you seal off the crown of a hat if you're working towards the crown and you just sort of tie all the stitches together and pull them tight it cinches them in like that it does that but with the cast on stitches so the live stitches are facing outwards rather than inwards and i wanted to know if there was a way to do it for double knitting because i've got some ideas of some stuff that i want to do which would start off like that but i don't want to have the same color on both sides so i uh i contacted lucy and asked her if she knew anything like this, and she said, hmm, let me have a think. And at the same time, I had a think. And uh, we both come up with different things, actually. Uh, she came up with a way which she... We'd never actually met Lucy and I, but we had been in contact on, on Instagram and stuff over the years. Um, and recently, in this last week, all my dreams came true. We had a Zoom meeting. I could talk to that lady for hours and hours and hours. We were on the online for a, at least an hour chatting and nerding out about this kind of stuff and showing each other bits and pieces that we were working on. Um, now, her version absolutely is one colour on each side, but she says she's not happy with it because she said she's cheated. She cast on, I, I can't remember exactly what she said she did, she cast on two things separately, interlaced them and pulled them around in a circle and tied it up. So it was, the end result is kind of what you're looking for, but it's not an elegant way of, of, of achieving it. My version, this is very funny, we, I showed her a photograph of this little swatch I'm about to show you, and it works, it's easy and it's very, very logical. The only thing is, rather like the long tail cast on shows a contrast decorative edge, this version has nothing to do with long tail at all, but it, similarly, it has a decorative 
contrast center, but it is different on both sides. So it obeys all the rules that I wanted it to. And here it is. This is what I come with. So you can see, ignore the green around the outside, I just ran out of yarn. So you can see that um, dark purple center there. And on the other side, it's got a light purple center there. Now it's absolutely 100% reversible. You see that there? Very nice. And there, and so you can't really see, but it's the same, just with the dark purple. And it works very, very well. Um, when I showed this to Lucy, I sent her a, a message before we chatted. She says, yes, we've got some contamination. <laughs> Not so I said, that's a bit harsh. Contamination. <laughs> I said, would you, would you call the edging on a long tail cast on contamination or decorative? <laughs> Now, obviously, the ultimate goal would be to have a version of this that doesn't have the decorative contamination that this one does. However, in lieu of finding one, I'm very happy with this. I think it's kind of nice. It's really neat and tidy and it really does the job. Um, and it, it satisfies my um, need for reversibility. It satisfies my... Um, uh, the idea that I, I need the, the the two colours not, not to be the same, you, you know, all the stuff I've just said. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the time, which is why I'm losing my, my, my thread here. So I, while we were talking, Lucy and I, she said, well, what it probably needs, therefore, rather than, because anything like this that has the, uh, the different colour in the centre, um, what we know about the tubular cast on, the one I would normally use for scarves for double knitting, uh, for double knitting, this is double knitting, I'm muddling up my techniques. Um, she said, what we know about that is that you get this clean line where the two colours just meet. The stitches kind of interlace like that, but the two colours meet in the middle and you get this cl nice clear delineation between the two. She said, what you would need therefore is some way of having a tubular cast on, but having the tail wrapped through it or threaded into it that you could then pull. And she says, but I'm not sure it's possible. Uh, and I started thinking about it. And I, I said, well, let's have a go. So I picked up a needle and some yarn. I set up my fingers and thumb as if to do the uh, um, long, the, the, the tubular cast on anyway. I wrapped the tail around and back over again. So I had this sort of big loop going on here. And I thought, well, if I just if I do the swirls and the swoops that will give me the pair of stitches cast on for the two colour tubular cast on, let's, let's give it a go, I said, all excited, thinking it's probably not going to work, but it sounds feasible. And I went for it, and of course, the loops of the, sorry, the, the strands from the big loop that I was casting into all got tangled up around the needles, and it was a complete and utter mess. And she says, yes, and said, the other problem is you, you're cast, you have to cast on into, it's, it's, a, it's a closed loop and you, you're always going to get that problem. <sighs> I was daunted. I refused to be thwarted. I often say in my classes, never confuse daunted with thwarted. And I think that's a good motto for life. Something can be daunting, but it shouldn't make you think that, it's, that that's it, game over. So I thought more and more and more about it. And actually there absolutely is a way to do it. Um, and after Lucy and I had said goodbye, I picked up the yarn and needles again. Um, and I thought, well, maybe there's a way, rather than including the loop in every movement, I could just sort of do the tubular cast on, but where necessary, and I couldn't work out what was necessary at first, but only when needed do I go and include the loop itself. And it really works. It really works. My first um, attempt at it, there is a problem with it, and I'm trying to fix that problem, but the, the concept is sound. Um, here it is, <laughs> it's tiny, I know. Didn't even cast it off, just put a loop of yarn through the stitches. Um, it's perfect. It's really, really perfect. It's the same color all the way to the center. The problem is, because it's a tension issue, so it's my doing. It's not really a flaw with the pro with the product. Um, on the other side, you can see some of the green stitches in the centre poking through from the other side. Now that's not because it's different on both sides, but instead of the stitches meeting in the centre, my 
My tension means I cast on one set of stitches looser than the other, so they're bulging round like that. So it's just pushing through. That means with a bit of tidying up of my, t of learning where the problem is happening with my tension, trying to fix it, that would be perfect. Just, uh, that would be absolutely perfect. And it is, it shows me it works. So I've had another go. In fact, I've had a go today. Um, and uh, I've got better. There's still a flaw in the middle, and that's I think where I'm starting. Um, I'm getting uh, I'm getting a bit of a blip from just how how the tails are. So this is something that's probably fixable. But here is uh, here is the cast on. That's the little blip there. But you can see that apart from that that one purple stitch there, the blue does go right to the centre with all of these strands here. And then on the other side, it's the blue is bleeding through a little bit, so it's still my tension problem. It's but it's it's not bad. So this is this is the bit you pull. So you pull that nice and tight, and everything, the hole in the middle cinches up and disappears. But it's it shows you that it's possible. It's doable. Now I'm not sure at the moment. I still haven't decided whether I want to pursue that and really figure out exactly how to stop that bulge coming through from one side to the other, because it does... <sighs> Theoretically, it should be perfect, but because of that, it means that the two sides aren't the same. One is one flat colour and one is the colour of the other colour from the other side coming through, and it really bugs me. This, on the other hand, while, while not one colour on what each side, it does satisfy my need for reversibility perfectly well. So I don't know what I prefer at the moment. If it were easy to get this one working exactly as I want it to, without that little blip and without the bulging through, then this is surely the ideal. But if it's, if it's something that requires absolute perfection in the execution, otherwise it doesn't work at all, then that's not really viable. So I'm a little bit stumped. I do quite like this, a little bit of a lacy, lacy double knitted brioche going on here, right from the centre, I'm just, just mucking around really. Um, but it, oh, so close, so close. Uh, so that's that's been my experimental time recently. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, oh, I should, I should be pointing, I should have got, my other bit of knitting, it's in another room and Ben's working, I don't want to disturb him. Um, so I'm, I'm re-knitting one of the patterns for the book. Um, I have, I already have a completed version of it, but it's in yarn I don't like and I don't want to showcase the yarn in the book. So I am re-knitting that and I'm making amendments to it as well. The original scarf was far too long. It, you may remember me talking about my Trevolution scarf. Whether or not it will end up being called Trevolution in the book, I don't know, because uh, I had the great good fortune to spend some time a couple of days ago on Zoom, of course, with David and Cher. Uh, David and Cher, who uh, live in the US, and they are some of my uh, very generous backers and pledgers for the, getting the book uh the the right the the Kickstarter fund for the book over the edge, and the reward that they pledged for was to be able to name one of the patterns in the book. My phone is just sort of adjusting the light horribly to get darker and darker. Um, they had uh, they pledged to name one of the patterns in the book. Now I've said to them actually I want them to name three. So we spent uh, an hour and a half the other night, and I took them through. I introduced them to all the the patterns that are already knitted um, and, and showed them sort of the genesis of the ideas of them so they get a sense of what they wanted to call them. So they're going to choose which patterns they want. I'm not going to uh, select them for them. So I'm going to give them that when the when all the knitting is done, I shall give them the free reign of every single pattern in it and say, choose three and then choose how to name them. So we had, if you're watching David and Cher, we had such, a, I had such a lovely time meeting you. I can't wait to uh, sort of take you a little bit further on that journey. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is uh, because I wanted to mention that it had a name because it was going to be a pattern for a magazine a couple of years ago. But then I noticed that I there was more to this uh, technique than I had first thought, and then I thought I really wanted to do this book. So I, I took the magazine, I took the book out of the, 
I took the pattern out of the magazine um, and it's been sort of on the back burner ever since. So it's never been published. It was originally called Tree Evolution because it's like the evolution of a tree. I told you I like making up words. Um, but it, uh, it probably won't be called that. It will hopefully be called something else. It'll be given a new lease of life with uh, with my own yarn, actually. But I'm in the knitting process at the moment, so there's not really much to show you. Uh, I'll show you that next time. I've also uh, one of the other backers of the book, uh, lovely Jen. Hello, Jen, if you're watching. I had the great good fortune to spend time with Jen. Uh, she had pledged for um, an online class with me. So. More about that. I am, I, th I touched on this last time, um, Jen and I had a wonderful time and we did the Knit Nerdism class together. Um, now Knit Nerdism is my philosophy of knitting, it's about looking at your knitting at a forensically small level to understand the building blocks of it so you can put those building blocks together in any way you like and make your knitting behave. Um, Jen had two issues with her knitting that she was particularly unhappy with um, and we used the, the, the sort of the learnings of knit nerdism to to help her to fix those problems one of them was a loopy edge whenever she did stocking stitch so she always had large baggy stitches at the end and couldn't tighten those up however she wanted to knit nerdism tells you look at where the problem is happening where it's created and then you can work out how and when to fix it it's not always where you think um, and the other thing was that we did is, you know, with, with decreases, if you've got a nice tidy line of knit two together and you've got this flabby line of SSKs going up the other side, you can learn with understanding why the SSK is flabby, you can neaten it up immeasurably and make it match your knit two together. So these are the things that can be taught in Knit Nerdism. And I have decided I'm going to open up Knit Nerdism only, it's the only class I'm going to do this for, for online um, Zoom seminars, webinars, if you like. Uh, it's not a practical class. It's a more of a lecture-based class. So I don't need to be able to see everyone's knitting. I just need to be able to interact with people if they've got questions. So I can open it up to a larger number of people. So watch this space. I'm going to be starting, um, hopefully by the end of this week, I'm gonna get some stuff up on my website. Um, and it's going to be talking about uh, dates and scheduled times for the Knit Nerdism webinars. I'm going to hopefully host those as often as I can for um, sort of a maximum of about 15 people, I think. So it'd be, be nice. there will be a big group, um, but it won't be unmanageably big. But I'm also going to be opening up the, the booking slots for the private one to one classes with me. And I will offer any of the classes that I do already as a one to one. So that's double uh, demystifying double knitting, the double knitted lace, the shaping double knitting, uh, Strantasia um, and Knit Nerdism and after the book is published, there will be lessons, one-to-ones for double knitted brioche as well. So there's going to be a lot of stuff coming and I'm going to be, I'm looking into at the moment, finding ways of being able to, people to be able to book certain slots um, and sort of book online rather than have to go through the whole email backwards and forwards because that's a lot of admin for both of us and uh, more than I I don't want to be overwhelmed with that just for the sake of making it happen. So if I can find a way of streamlining everything, that's the way I'm going to be doing it. So hopefully by not this weekend, but uh, first weekend in June, hopefully those bookings will be up and running. I'm really excited about that. Um, teaching Jen the other day has reminded me how much I miss teaching. Obviously, at the moment, we uh, we can't be getting together and doing that kind of teaching anyway, but I've kind of retired from, from public teaching largely in any case. So I, this has sort of been spurred on by lockdown because I've noticed how successful things are, but I was gonna be doing these one-to-one -one classes for my backers and pledges anyway, and I've realised how successful they are. So if you are interested in having a class with me, if you've always wanted to and I've never been in your part of the world, this is now your opportunity. I'm really, really excited. It works so, so well. I can have a multi-camera setup so I can show you knit nitty cam so you can see close-ups of what my hands are doing. Um, and it, and 
you'll get the one-to-one -one individual attention that you could never get in a large class anyway, even though we might be sitting on opposite sides of the world. It's a very, very successful way of doing it, and I can't wait to be able to release it properly. If you are interested, um, do drop me a line, nathan at sockmetician.com, because even if I don't get the booking process up and running at the moment, you might as well sort of say, I'd like a class, um, can we book a date, please? Let me know, let me know your preferred dates. I'm sure we can fit something in. We don't need to wait, really, but I'll, um, ultimately that's what I, I want to have done so that it's easy and streamlined. But in lieu of that at the moment, if you're, if you're eager in your um, sort of lockdown period to be able to get some new skills under your belt, then by all means, drop me a line and, uh, and, and let's, let's work it out. Uh, so I, but I, I'll get it up on the website and then I'll put out a newsletter. So if you haven't subscribed to my newsletter already, do head over to sockmetician.com, hover on the, uh, the home page for about five seconds and before you know it, whew, in will fly a little window with uh, a MailChimp sign-up form, and it's very easy. Um, I only send out newsletters when I've got something to say. I don't do it as a sort of blog-style stuff. It's when I've got something, a new pattern being released or a big announcement or something like that, so you won't be inundated. Um, but it is probably the best way of keeping up to date with all the big stuff and knowing exactly where to go with all the right links in all the right places. Otherwise, of course, you can subscribe to my channel here on YouTube. If you haven't done so already, please do. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram as well. I'm going to cut this off because I've been talking for an hour and a quarter and I've still got to do my Zoom B-along and then edit this and try and get it all out and I'll never sleep. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure spending time with you today. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of your, your knitting journey and I am so grateful to each and every one of you, as always, for being part of my ongoing journey. Your support will always mean a lot. So while this podcast episode really is a finished object. Remember, more than ever, life is a work in progress. Just take it one stitch at a time and above all else, be kind to each other. Lots of love to you next time. Bye bye. Hello, it's me again. Don't worry, the podcast really is over. I've just popped in, however, to say if you enjoyed it and you want to make sure you never miss another episode, why not click on this handy little subscribe button right here. Don't say I never do anything for you. Or if you're worried that you might have missed out on some really fun stuff from previous episodes, I've got a playlist link for you here, which has got all of the previous Sock Condition podcast episodes on it, so you never need to feel out of the loop again. Bye for now.